All right, Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, and I always try to keep this short. <laughs> Never seems to work out for me, does it? And uh, this week, chapter 22, there's 46 verses, same as last week, 46 verses. But I hope to go through quickly, um, because there's not a lot here to get into, actually. It's just a lot of just reading it, and it's just things that happened. But I want to start today with a uh, correction from last week. I corrected it on the video, but I didn't get to correct it here in person. I got my two uh, eastern gates mixed up last week. So I want to make sure I get that right. And I guess that's a good deal to give us an idea. I went ahead and drove, uh, drew up here all the gates. But uh, the eastern gate that Jesus went through is this one. It's called the Mercy Gate, the Golden Gate, or the Beautiful Gate. It's also called the Shushan Gate, but it's also called the Gate of Eternal Life. And it's the gate that enters into the temple, and it's the one that right now is closed up because one of the Muslim leaders said the, the uh, Jews say the Messiah is coming through that gate. So I don't want him, so they shut it up. But I talked about this gate, and I was wrong, so I just want to make sure I correct that. Amen? And, but there's two eastern gates, so you can see how they're so close together. But Jesus is the sheep, and he is the lion. So I got that right. I just confused those two gates. Now I put temple right here because I think it was Josephus or one of those guys said that when you stand on the Mount of Olives, you can look straight in to the temple. So where that is over there now, if you'll look, there's a big empty spot right there. If you look at the map. Here's the Dome of the Rock that the Muslims built, and they think they built it where the uh, temple was. Well, there's no need to destroy that. For years I've heard Christians say, well, when that, that's destroyed and they rebuild the temple right there, why can't they build it right there where it most likely was before? I think it's Konanea House. Chuck Missler has a real good video on YouTube about how the temple was probably right there because you could have seen through that gate into the temple. So last week, this is the gate that Jesus went in. Okay, not that one. I just want to make sure. But still, Jesus is the sheep, and he is going to come back as the lion. And he must have gone through that gate many times. But in what we read last week, it was through this gate that he went through. And that's the gate he's going to come through again when he comes back at the Battle of Armageddon. He puts his feet on the Mount of Olives, and he comes back into that gate, and he sets up as the the king, all right, for, for a thousand years. So there's eight gates to Jerusalem. Now, I read somewhere online that there used to be 10. So I'm thinking, well, could there have been 12? Because in New Jerusalem, there's 12 gates. So I'm wondering if we don't hear, if the Lord doesn't come back, if we don't hear some archaeologists say, oh, we just discovered a new gate in Israel. Wouldn't that be something? I bet you there was probably 12, but they only have said there were 10 at one time, and now there's only eight gates. Okay, I want to make sure I made that correction so you know. Now, the outline to what we'll be studying today in Matthew chapter 22 is the parable of a wedding feast, verses 1 through 14. Verse 15 to 22, paying tribute to Caesar. Now, tribute's a little bit different than taxes, but it's, it's so close. It's, but there is a little bit of a differentiation, and I want to give that to you. Verse 23 to 33 is the question about the resurrection. Verse 34 to 40 is the great commandment. Verse 41 to 46, ask who Christ is. So a question about who is the Christ. But here's all the gates, okay? I hope you get that. That's fun to study those different gates. So we're going to be talking today about wedding, taxes, and resurrection. So without further ado, Matthew chapter 22. And now we get to a, a chapter that you hardly hear anybody preach on or talk about. Very seldom do they even talk about this. Most talk about chapter 23 and 24. And we're going to get to chapter 23 and 24, not next week, but the week after, okay? But before we can get there, we've got to go through chapter 22. And there's not a lot in this chapter, but we do start to see Jesus fed up with the Pharisees and Sadducees. You can tell he's starting to get a little bit put out by these people. And that's why because they're coming to him, trying to tempt him, trying to get him and catch him in his words. What we'll see today, what Jesus says next week. <laughs> Jesus just goes off on him, okay? He's just like, listen here, guys. And he just, wow, he, he just, wow, he hammers them. In, in this chapter, we see one time in chapter 22, Jesus calls them hypocrites, verse 18. When we get to chapter 23, seven times, Jesus calls them hypocrites. So it's pretty interesting. What is a hypocrite, by the way? Someone who pretends to be something they're not. 
an actor in Hollywood, perhaps. I always look at an actor as a hypocrite because he's pretending to be somebody he's not. So he calls them hypocrites in verse 18. All right. So now we see Jesus coming out swinging a little bit and telling it like it is. And he's not name calling a lot. He'll do that next chapter. But he is just getting fed up with these Pharisees who were coming to him with question after question after question. And what's so amazing is how he just shuts them up. They think they're going to, oh, we're going to stir up something. And then they're like, oh, man. And they walk away. So it's very exciting. It's very fun to read this. But it starts out with a parable. And we've had a lot of fun with parables, haven't we? Huh. Well, this one appears to be a little easier to understand. And so we'll look at that first. So why don't we just read verse 1 through 14 all together. And then we'll go back and comment verse by verse. So Matthew chapter 22, verse 1. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven, that's not the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is likened to a certain king which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them which were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. And when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and delivered those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage." So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both good and bad. And the wedding was furnished with guests. Notice it says guests, not a bride. Doesn't tell us anything about the bride. It's talked about guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how comest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. So this is a parable about a father throwing a wedding for his son. And that father just wanted as many guests as he could get. It's really fun to have a lot of people at a wedding, isn't it? A lot of people, when they have a wedding, they expect many people. And then they start dishing out money and it gets expensive to have a wedding. I like small weddings. <laughs> I like them on a shoestring budget, if you will. But uh, a lot of people, they like those big weddings. And I don't know why that is. Um, I guess they just like to see a lot of people having a good time. And there's nothing wrong with that. So who is this and what is this talking about? There are several ways to look at this. One is look at it as to Jews only before 70 AD. Why do I say 70 AD? That's when Jerusalem was destroyed by the army of Rome. Another way is to apply it to the church age, but the other way is to apply it from here all the way out here. So let me see if I can write that up here, and I want you to, to see what we're looking at here. So the kingdom of heaven, all right? This is the kingdom of God over here. But we've looked at the kingdom of heaven is when Jesus is on earth. So the kingdom of heaven is here, but it starts up again over here. And it goes from here to here. So when Jesus is telling this story, right about here is 70 A.D. when, when uh, Jerusalem is destroyed. So one option is he's just telling them about that and that this is over here. But as you read it over and over, it looks like it applies out here too. It's got to apply to the tribulation and millennium because when Jesus comes back here at Armageddon, he cast into outer darkness all his enemies cast them into hell. So I can see it applying from here to here. And remember, this is the parentheses period, the church age. So we just kind of skip from here to here. But it also sounds like it's mentioning something there. So there's a lot of different ways to look at it. Now, a lot of people will look at this passage and say, oh, it only applies to the church age. And God wants you to go to the wedding. So he wants you to be saved. Well, when we're saved, we're the bride of Christ. We're not guests. <laughs> So that's a spiritual application if they try to preach it like that. What is the literal application? Well, literally, it sounds like he's talking to the Jews. So we go back and we look, and in 
it says here in verse 1, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which made a marriage for his son. So the king would be the father in this case. And the father in heaven sent his son Jesus. So the son is Jesus. And the Jesus is supposed to come and take a bride. And he's supposed to get married to his bride. Well, we know today that the bride is the church, right? But had this not taken place, there still would have been enough people saved right here. And I believe the body of Christ starts with the cross. Amen. A lot of people try to make it way out here after with Paul. But that could have been the bride, those people that got saved there. That would have been a lot of Jews, wouldn't it? <laughs> a lot less Gentiles. So th that could apply. Okay. So he goes and he says, hey, um, my son's getting married and he sends his servants out. And there it says in verse 3, And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. And they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants. It's interesting, that term remnant. A lot of times when we hear of a remnant, that reminds us of the remnant of Jews in the tribulation that make it through. But it says, The remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. So when did they slew? slew? Well, if it's way back here in the Old Testament, and those were the servants were the prophets, do you know how many prophets were killed? Was it, I saw it today, was it Isaiah? Was, uh, it was uh, how do they call it, Yun Asunder. He was cut in half. So a lot of those Old Testament prophets, they, they were killed by the people in charge in Israel because they didn't want to hear what they said. So could it be applying to that far back? Well, here's John the Baptist and he was killed. Could it be applying to that? Uh, could it be all just back here and then 70 AD is when he's done with this? Or does it have more of an application? Remember, a lot of times there's a double application. But I would look at that. That sounds like those Old Testament prophets. A lot of them were, were slain. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he set forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Now that happened way back when, when Babylon came in too, right? So some people look at this as only in the past. Then saith he to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Well, the Jews, are they worthy? <laughs> A lot of them are in apostasy, so they're not ready to accept Jesus as their Messiah. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Therefore go into the highways and bid as many. And it says they found those both bad and good. That almost sounds like, well, because the Jews rejected their Messiah, God tells us, hey, go out, whether you're good or bad, see if they'll get saved, see if they'll come to the wedding. But then they wouldn't be guests. They'd be part of the bride. So do you see how maybe it's back over here now. He's going to send the 144,000 and hey, you guys come to the wedding. Now, when is the wedding? All right. The rapture is for Jesus to come and to take his bride. And he takes his bride up here to the judgment seat of Christ. Now, there's two different thoughts on when the marriage supper of the lamb is. Some people say that up here is where Jesus marries his bride. Other people say, no, when we come back at Armageddon, then we have the wedding down here. Well, a lot of this has to do with the wedding feast. So it could be we get married up here and then we have the feast down here. The marriage supper of the Lamb could be down here on the earth. And these people make it through and they're the guests while we who are in our glorified bodies are all having a great big supper with Jesus. That's a, so I, I honestly can't say if it's up there or down here. But there's two thoughts on that. And one is the marriage supper is up in heaven. The other is we get judged up there and then married up there and they come down and have the feast down here on earth. Do you understand that? You see what I'm saying? So I wish I knew which one was which. I know there is a feast, though, at Armageddon. Do you know what the feast is at Armageddon? When Jesus comes and destroys all his enemies, says to the birds and the fowls and the eagles, come and feast. So they're feasting over there. Does that mean we'll be feasting with Jesus in his kingdom? So there's different ways to look at this. So maybe it does apply to some other servants going and getting some others. But 
if that's the case, then wouldn't they be part of the bride and not guests? So do you see how you kind of have to leave this out and make it here and here? That's the only way that it kind of sounds like it works. So when he's referring to the wedding, yes, that's the wedding of the bride. But these people are supposed to come to that wedding, not as part of the bride, but as the guests. So that's what I'm trying to say. That word guests is so important because uh, that's Jews that come as guests into that wedding. OK, does that make sense to you? Whew, that's hard to explain all that, but I did the best I could. So now we go back to Matthew chapter 22 and uh, we look at verse 11. Now, do you see the paragraph mark in your Bible? Mine has a paragraph mark. Uh, I like how my Bible has lots of paragraph marks because when it changes from one thing to another, it gives you a paragraph mark. So verse 11 says, And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. Now why it has a paragraph mark, I don't know, because it should have one down in verse 15. No, oh, it does, it does. But this is still part of that parable, verse 11. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. Now what does that mean? What is a wedding garment? Well, in those days, the man saved up for the wedding for his daughter, and he would actually buy the clothes for the people that came. So you would want to go to a wedding if you needed a new garment. <laughs> I mean, let's say you're poor. <laughs> hey, man, you're having a wedding. Can I come? You get a new set of clothes. I mean, that's kind of a good thing. But someone comes in without a wedding garment. When we're saved, we get a garment. We get a white robe. It's not something that we we purchase. It's not something we get because we're worthy, right? Verse eight, we're not worthy. That's why we have to trust Jesus because we can't save ourselves. So verse nine, go ye therefore into the highways and as many as you shall find bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found both good and bad. And um, now I went back and read too much. Verse 12, verse 12. And he saith unto him, friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Now, interestingly enough, when I see that word friend, do you know who that makes me think of? Who did Jesus say was his friend? That's in Matthew 26, I believe it is, verse 50. That's Judas. So see how some people say back here? And so the wedding could have been here. Remember, it had to be three and a half years to finish out that prophecy. And then over here, Jesus could have come back at Armageddon. So I guess this would have been the bride. I don't know. Uh, and the guests would be those that make it through. But they rejected Jesus as their Savior. But friend, that reminds me of Judas. That's interesting. Now, coming in without a wedding garment, coming into what? It just it sounds like it has to be somebody in the tribulation making into the millennial kingdom. And we who are saved, we're the bride of Christ. Now they're the guests. You see what I'm saying? So coming in without a wedding garment, maybe somebody took the mark of the beast here and they somehow make it through. And then the Lord goes, what's that spot you have on there? You have got one of my robes. You're not one of mine. And what happens to that person? They're cast down into where? H-E double hockey sticks, right? So let's look at this. It says here, and he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, when Jesus says to cast someone into outer darkness and he says there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, what is he talking about? Well, let's flip back to Matthew chapter 8. Whenever you see weeping and gnashing of teeth, that's always a reference of somebody going to hell. And that's where they're going to be gnashing their teeth. Matthew chapter 8, verse 10 through 12. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and continues there. So it's the kingdom. It's like right there, tied together. It's the kingdom. So it sounds like someone makes it in the tribulation, but they don't get saved in the sense that they didn't endure to the end. They took the mark of the beast when they shouldn't. God says, well, you can't come into my kingdom with the mark of Lucifer, with the mark of Satan. Now look at... Uh, Matthew chapter, let's see, I've got it written here somewhere. Uh, Matthew 24, okay, Matthew 24, 50. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 50. 
The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So there again is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now that's connected with hell. And let me show you that. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. You know what it means to gnash your teeth? It means to go like that. You're just grinding your teeth backwards and forth. And that's what somebody does when they're in pain. They're like, ah, you know, you ever do that? Matthew chapter 13 and verse 24. Matthew 13, 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Okay. Am I in the right chapter? Okay. Then I says, go to verse 50. Okay. Verse 50. Okay. And shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Cast them into what? A furnace of fire. So that gnashing of teeth thing has to do with, in context, seems like it's always talking about a kingdom and seems like the context is it's hell. So somebody goes to hell because they wouldn't be a guest at the wedding. Now, if they got saved and they were part of the bride, they wouldn't go to hell. So who is it that doesn't go and get married? Who's left behind? It'd have to be the Jews. So do you see how it applies to here and yet over here? Getting from here into here. That's the only way that I can see that thing after reading it over and over and over and over again. Now, like I said, some people try to preach that as, hey, you need to come to Jesus and you get saved and get a robe so you can get in. It, but you're still a guest. You're not the bride. So it's kind of hard to force that into the church age. Do you see what I'm saying? So unless it's like the bachelor and I guess all these guests come and then he decides which one he chooses. <laughs> oh, I hate that show. I can't believe people watch that. You probably do, don't you? No, I'm just kidding. But um, it's just what a horrible thing. And most of the time they get divorced after the show, don't they? That's so, oh, so evil. OK, so there's that parable. And I did the best I could to show you. And then it says in verse 14 of Matthew 22, for many are called, but few are chosen. Now, what do uh, Calvinists do? That's a salvational verse. <laughs> no, the context isn't getting saved. It's becoming a guest to get into the kingdom. So many are called to come into the kingdom. Many are called to be guests at the wedding, but very few are chosen. So there'll be few Jews that are actually saved through all this. Actually, few Gentiles, very few Gentiles, I think, will make it through. If they don't take the mark of the beast, maybe they'll come in and be some guests, too. A lot to get into there, but we'll continue and move on. So Matthew chapter 22 and verse 15. Matthew 22 and verse 15. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. So here they are trying to entangle Jesus in his talk. They're trying to get him to say something stupid so that then they can go, ha, ah, look at this guy. Well, it backfires on him and it doesn't work. So the Pharisees, and then it says in verse 16, and they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying. Now, I think a little later, uh, yeah, verse 23, the same day came unto him the Sadducees. So there's what's called the Sanhedrin in Israel. Do you know what the Sanhedrin is? It's the governing body. And it consists of three. And I've told you two before. I don't know if I've ever talked about the Herodians before. So the Pharisees, the Herodians, and the Sadducees. The Herodians are actually mentioned three times in the Bible, and those are the references. And what were the Herodians? Well, they were Jews that were religious leaders that were fully in bed with Rome. Whatever Herod said, let's do it. Because they didn't want to make waves against Rome that had taken them over. So they just said, hey, let's do whatever they say. Well, what if they said to do something that's against the Bible? Well, they probably would have done it just to get along. They were like, I don't know, I don't even know what the word is for people like that, but carpetbaggers maybe. I don't know what word would you use for somebody that, that will compromise their principles to just get along so they don't have to suffer. You know what I'm saying? That's who these people were. They were Jews that were worshiping and following the Romans. And many of the Jews at that time thought that the Christ was going to come to free them from the Romans. So these would have been the enemy to most of the people who thought Jesus was the king that was there to deliver them. So that's the Herodians, okay? Now, back in, remember Herod? He was the biggest adulterer. So they were basically saying adultery is okay. When the law says, no, you stone people that are adulterers. 
So you see how they had to give up what they believed in order to follow that crowd over there? Pretty interesting. So verse uh, 16. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true. Now, there's four things they say here. One of them's a lie. This is how the devil works. He comes to you with a lot of truth, and then every now and then he'll throw in a lie. Once you start believing him, he'll throw in more lies, more, and then he can lie to you anytime he wants and never tell any truth, and you'll believe everything. So I found it very interesting. There's four things here. And they said, Master, we know that thou art true. Well, that's one of the things, and that's true. Jesus is true. And teacheth the way of God in truth. That is correct. Neither carest thou for any man. Is that true? No. no. For thou regardest not the person of men. Is that true? Well, hold on a minute. That one might be true. But that other one there, that thou carest not, what did Jesus come for? <laughs> he knew they were going to reject him. He cared enough about him. He was willing to die for him. So how dare they say, you don't care about anybody. That's what they're saying. Yeah, I do. I, came, I care enough about you to come down here and live for 33 years and put up with your sorry butts because you bunch of sinners are just vexing me every day. And I love you enough to die for you. What do you mean I don't care about you? Right? So they get it wrong about 25% of the time. What does the Bible say? Well, look at 1 Peter 5, 7. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. The Bible says that Jesus does care. So 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7 says, Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Isn't that a wonderful promise to know that He cares about me? Now, does God regard a person? Well, let's look. Let's, it says, For thou regardest not the person of men. So that's true. Jesus doesn't regard the person of man. Look at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 6. But... Who is Jesus? Here we go again. Jesus must be God. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 6. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. So God doesn't accept or regard any man's person. God doesn't exalt men above himself. So yeah, God doesn't really regard a person in the sense that he thinks they're something better than they are. He sees they're all sinners, right? So they get it wrong out of four. They get it wrong one time. But Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh who does care enough that he died for our sins. Okay, so it's important that we understand that. So these Pharisees, they come and they think they know everything, but they're so messed up. What a horrible thing to say to somebody. Come up to them. Hey, I know you don't care about anybody, but I just want to ask you a question. That's basically what they're doing. But see how they hid it in this night. We know you're a good person, a good teacher, and, you, and you're teaching it, but I know you don't care about anybody. But anyway, let me just, you ever hear people do that to you? They'll, they'll say two or three good things to butter you up and then throw something else that's an attack and then say some more good stuff. I've had people say that to me. But I know how that feels. So you see Jesus, he, he heard that whole thing. He's like, hold on there now. And now he didn't respond or anything like that in the sense of, yeah, I do care about you. But it was funny how they how they threw that in there. They're, they're hiding in there their attack toward him. So that's what you call a veiled attack. Have you ever heard that before, that term? But verse 18, But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? So Jesus says, Okay, you're going to name call a little bit and say I'm uncaring? Well, you're a bunch of hypocrites. <laughs> but why tempt ye me? What was the temptation? Uh, I skipped verse 17. On purpose. Let's go back to verse 17. So they come up to him. They try to butter him up. They throw out a little bit of attack. And then they say, Tell us therefore what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or no? So they come up to him and they talk about tribute. Now today we talk about taxes. Is tribute a tax? In a way it is. But there's tribute and there's taxes. And they're a little bit different. Taxes, when we think about taxes, it's the government saying, Hey, you owe us this for this. And guess what? They want your income tax. Do you know that's communism? A heavy progressive income tax? A lot of people say, according to the Constitution, that's illegal. But I pay my income tax. You know why? I don't want to go to jail. Now, you can call it extortion if you want, and that's how I feel sometimes. They're extorting me, but hey, I do it because, like my dad said, you can't fight a tank. Okay, so when the mafia comes, you do what they tell you. That's the way that my dad always looked at it. So I do my best to do my taxes like everybody else. But a tribute is a little bit different than a tax 
because taxing is usually a, a government telling you you got to pay this much. Well, a tribute is a little bit different. Not a lot, but a little. Let me read the definition of a tribute from the 1828 dictionary. And this is interesting because uh, Hollywood, like we talked about earlier, they don't make films just for entertainment. They're indoctrinating people. And they came out with a film called The Hunger Games. And in that film, it talks about tribute. And it's not just money. It was your children. Hmm. So I'll get into that here in a second. But look at this. 1828 Webster's Dictionary. What is a tribute? An annual or stated sum of money or other valuable thing paid by one prince or nation to another, either as an acknowledgement of submission or as the price of peace and protection, or by virtue of some treaty. The Romans made their conquered countries pay tribute, as do the Turks at this day. And in some countries, the tribute is paid in children. So what's your Hunger Games thing about? You give your children, then they go fight to the death and kill each other. That's horrible. I mean, that, oh, that's just awful. So a tribute was, because we conquered you, you must submit to us. So you see why the Jews didn't look at Rome as, hey, yeah, that's, that's our government. <laughs> They're like, no, God made us. We, we want to be the, the government of God made us, but we'll pay this to them so we can have peace. Otherwise, they're going to come kill us. And I haven't talked about the Maccabeans before, but there's what's called the Maccabean time in history when I can't remember how many years. It was probably hundreds of years that the Jews fought Rome. And so there was always this rebellion, this desire in the Jews to be free of the yoke of Rome. And I meant to say it last week and I totally forgot. You know who Rome is? Rome took over the known world in its day. So it was the globalist government, wasn't it? And so they yearn to be free from the globalist. <laughs> wow, we don't know anything about that today, do we? Or do we finally live in a time in history where we like, oh, I get what they're thinking. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's kind of interesting. It really is. So this is tribute. So tribute is money, but it also could be your children. Isn't that scary? What did Pharaoh want? Pharaoh told Moses, you can leave. Take all the Just leave your kids with us. And they're like, nope, that dog won't hunt. We're taking our kids with us. So that's an interesting thing. So a tribute's kind of like a tax because they're making you pay. But it's usually when someone else has taken over your government. Now you're a tributary or you're a, a provincial state of another country. There's, I forget what the word is for that, but you know, when, when another country takes you over and now you're a um, puppet state, I guess would be the way to call that. And so that's what's going on there at the time. So they are asking Jesus, you know, should we pay tribute? Now, everybody looks at this today and they just change the word tribute to taxes. And they say, should we pay taxes? Well, what if somebody came to a preacher and say, should we pay taxes? If he says no, IRS is at your door, <laughs> right? So as a preacher, I'm not going to say no. But uh, at the same time, why are they asking this? Because they know that they've been taken over by people that shouldn't be there. And so they're trying to catch Jesus in his words. And they're trying to say, oh, oh he's against the government. He's anti-government, anti-taxes. OK, don't ever say that that's what I am. OK, uh, I don't want people to think that I'm not telling people to do that. Don't pay your taxes. OK, but uh, he says here, why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought it to him a penny. Now, a penny is a day's wage in the time the King James Bible came out. And uh, in the day's wage back then was a denarius. So people always run to the Greek language and say it's denarius here. And a denarius is a silver coin that's about the size of a silver dime. And that's about a day's wage in the old days. At least they had real money back then. <laughs> All we have is toilet paper. I mean, uh, pieces of paper. Um, and that's not real money, a piece of paper. You know, they, they have a money that, that's like a piece of paper with real gold in it. Gold, gold that, to me, that's real money. That would be really cool if they'd come out with that again. All right, so Jesus says, show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. So he brought him this little thing. And he saith unto them, whose is this image and superscription? Well, if you look at the money, it has Caesar on it. Now, which Caesar? Well, any one of them that was before that time. A lot of people say this was Caesar Tiberius. It could, could have been Julius Caesar. It could have been the one before him, Octavius. It could, have been, it could have been any one of the Caesars because, you know, they were always, when a new Caesar came over, 
and came in power, they'd put his face. So there were a lot of those circulating, and so it could have been anybody. And he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? Superscription is like a writing. They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he to, oh, by the way, I meant to say, I was going to put it up here on the video, a picture of what they say it would have been. And usually there's the head, and then the subscription would be the name of the guy around it. But when you look at the one that they think was the actual coin and you flipped it over, it said Pontifus Maximus. <laughs> so there we go again. It's almost like, oh, that reminds us of Catholicism. Who's in charge? Oh, the priests. Who's the bad guys? Oh, the priests. Who's the one always getting in bed with the government? Oh, the, the Jesuits, the priests. Oh, see how that always, oh, okay. Anyway, and they say unto him, Caesar's. Then he saith unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. So they were just like, uh, I don't know what to say. And they're walking away going, well, we can't get him for tax evasion because he didn't say, you know, don't pay your taxes. He didn't say, they, they didn't know. And basically he's saying, hey, who's the guy running this world? Caesar. Who's the guy that's making all the currency? Caesar. So if that's from him, then and he demands you pay it back, to, then you just do it. Uh, one of the best things you can do in life is barter. Because then there's no taxes. If I go to you and say, hey, I like that. I'll trade you this for that. Where's the tax on that? It's not. Go ahead. You had a question? Uh, it's interesting. When there it says, uh, render therefore to, unto Caesar the things. The things. What things? Yeah, what things? It's Rocks. It's plural. Yeah. It's, I, mean, I know they're talking about money there, but he didn't say money. Render the, the things. Money. Yeah. That That's an interesting thing. I didn't think about that. So it's in plural. So give to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar. A bag of sand. So if Caesar <laughs> says, I own this land, and you could have brought a bag of sand and given it to him, I don't know. But say, usually the tribute was in money. <clears throat> I've read a lot of Herodotus. I've read a lot of old people in the old days. And when the country came over, it was common to say, I want 100 gold coins or 1,000 gold coins per year as tribute money or 2,000 gold. So they had to have so many per year that they set aside. Where did that come from? Well, it came from whoever gave it. That's another thing. <laughs> the people often didn't go, oh, I want to give. No, I want to give. It was like, oh, we got to give this. And toward the end of the year, when it was time to pay the tribute, nobody wanted to give. So the guys that were in bed with them went around and said, it's time to pay. And they would have their goons, if you will. And if they had to beat it out of you, they would have. So it was giving grudging, grudgingly, right? It wasn't, I want to give this tribute. It's like, man, I hardly have anything. Now I got to give more to these people. So it wasn't something they wanted to do. It's almost like April 15th, how you feel. Oh, I got to do this again. <laughs> I've never met a person in my life that goes, I can't wait to pay my taxes. It's, it's one of those things where it's like grievous to you. It's like, oh man, the people that conquered us wanted some more. So anyway, that, that's interesting. But it is interesting. It says to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. So there's a lot of things that Caesar claims and lays claim to. But I think the line is your children. They don't belong to the state. The children belong to us, according to the Bible. Okay, so good. I, I wonder what those other things are now. That's a good question. So back to uh, Matthew chapter 22. Render, therefore, unto Caesar's the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which were God's. Now, I think here I had a, a reference. Um, let's go to Luke chapter 20 is the cross reference, I believe. Luke chapter 20. And in Luke chapter 20, we see it again, what is going on here. So Luke chapter 20, verse 19. Luke 20, 19, and it says it a little bit different. Luke 20, 19. And the chief priests and the scribes, the same hour, sought to lay hands on him, and they feared the people, for they perceived that he had spoken this parable against them. I believe that might have been the parable. No, that was a little bit different. Okay, that was a parable from a couple of chapters ago. And uh, then it says, And they watched him and sent forth spies, which should feign themselves just men, that they might take hold of his words, that so they might deliver him unto the power and authority of the governor. Who did we read were sent? The Herodians. They were spies for the government. Now that only happens in communism, right? So it almost became a communist government back then. And they asked him, saying, Master, we know that thou sayest and teachest rightly, neither acceptest thou the person of any, but teacheth the way of God truly. 
Is it lawful for us to give tribute unto Caesar or no? But he perceived their craftiness and said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Show me a penny, whose image and superscription hath it. They answered and said, Caesar. And he said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's, and unto God the things which be God's. And they could not take hold of his words before the people, and they marveled at his answer and held their peace. So they just wanted something to use against him, and they were spies. Do you think there might be spies today? You know how often we hear of agents that infiltrate things? And there's a word for that, that they agent provocateur, but they try to get someone to do something. Entrapment. Have you ever heard of entrapment? I knew a guy that was in Bible school with me that was entrapped by FBI agents or something. And he went to jail because they put in his head, hey, go do this. And they made him want to do it. And he did it. And they arrested him and said, ha, you can't do that. He probably would have never thought to do that if they hadn't told him to do. And so we're finding out that I don't want to say too much, but we're finding out that there's a lot of agents like that, a lot of spies like that. And so be careful. Um, truly vet people. you got to trust people. Find out who people are. I remember about twice that I got a phone call one time from this guy that was talking and was asking leading questions. And the thought in my head was, I bet this guy is working for some three-letter. Th and I just said, you know, the Bible says Jesus died for your sin. And he made it to where he wanted to hang up because he wanted to talk to me. And asked me lots of questions. What do you think about it? And I said, I'd rather just talk about you. Are you saved? Are you? And he finally just said, I don't want to talk to you anymore. But he sounded like he was one of those trying to get on record that I said this or this. I don't want to be that kind of guy. I'd rather stick with the Bible. So that was interesting. So watch out. There could be spies out there. Isn't that crazy? But you think that might be in today too? Probably. Yeah, I'm glad I didn't say it. But anyway, um, so going to uh, Matthew chapter 22. And where did we leave off here? It says here in verse 23, the same day. Well, let me see. I think I got everything in my notes. Let me let me back up real quick before we read verse 23. Um, Jesus perceives their wickedness. They're trying to get Jesus to commit treason or say he's anti-government or against Rome. So that's what's happening here is they want to say he's trying to overthrow the government. And he responds, you hypocrites. What is a hypocrite? 1828 definition of a hypocrite is one who feigns to be what he is not. One who has the form of godliness without the power or who assumes an appearance of piety and virtue when he is destitute of true religion. What a definition in the 1828 Webster Dictionary. I looked at it and go, wow, they're parading around, probably dressed like priests, saying that they're religious and they are completely destitute of religion. They're spies. They've sold out to the man. That's so wild, isn't it? So he basically says, you aren't real religious leaders, but you're political politicians who are working for the devil. Because ultimately, who's in charge of this world? Little G, God of this world, Satan. Who do you think uh, the Caesar in Rome was working for? Was he going to church on Sunday and saying how he loved Jesus? He was making sacrifices to false gods. So... These people, literally, I've said it before, and people have laughed a little bit. Breaker says that they were Satanists. But do you see why I would say that? They're working for the people that are working for Lucifer. Now, verse 23. The same day came unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection, and ask him. So first come the Pharisees, then the Herodians, then the Sadducees. So all of the religious leaders are against Jesus. And he's doing his best to stay under the radar and stay away from the political leaders of Rome. But now, because they work for Rome, they're trying to get them because they want Rome to kill them. That's what that's what ultimately their goal is. So they can say our hands are clean. We didn't do it. Ultimate hypocrisy when they're the ones that wanted Jesus killed, which say that there is no resurrection and ask him. So the Sadducees were a group of liberals. They were the modernists of today, the, the modern day modernists. They did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Now, everybody else did. Even the pagans believed in the resurrection of the dead. Have you ever heard of the Egyptians? There's a thing called the Book of the Dead. I bought that one time and tried to read it. I'm just like, this is so boring. And uh, it had been translated. And even the Egyptians believed that someday you're going to rise again from the dead and stand before a judgment. And you know what they taught? They taught your heart will be put in a scale. And if your heart is lighter than a feather, then you'll be allowed into the afterlife. 
So even the lost people believe that you didn't get away with it. You'd have to give account someday to a deity. But these guys, you know what? They scare me. These guys believe, no, man, you're dead. It's over. Well, if you truly believe that, then you can do whatever you want in this life. And you wouldn't feel bad about it because when you die, it's over. Almost sounds like a modern day Jehovah Witness <laughs> that says you don't have to give account to God. So if you really believe that you don't someday give account to God for your sins, don't you think you'd live a little bit different and do evil and not feel bad about it? We'll wait till we get to next week's chapter, what Jesus says about these people. They were robbing uh, the homes of widows. They were stealing from people. They were doing just the most wickedest things, and they didn't even care. That's so sad. That's so sad how hateful, how wicked, how evil. They have murder in their heart, and yet they're the ones in the front of the temple every Saturday. See, I didn't say Sunday because it's Saturday. Every Saturday. Can you see why Jesus was so put out with these people? It was the swamp, if you will, of his day. And it's like, these people are running everything? They don't even believe in a resurrection. So they come to Jesus, and the same day came to him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection, and ask him, saying, Master? Now why would he call him Master? They're buttering him up, because they don't believe he's their master. Moses said, If a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren. and the Now this is a... What if? This is a completely made up scenario that didn't happen. I don't believe. Now, maybe this really happened, but I don't find it in history. So I think what they're doing is, as my wife says, pulling something out of their <laughs> rear end and, and, and they're doing a great big, well, what if this happens? Mm -hmm. And my, my wife says all the time, we can't live in what ifs, right? So they're bringing up this great big what if. And what they're asking is something that we look at today and we go, oh, that's weird. Because we don't think like this. All right? Let's read this. Master, Moses said, If a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now that's what it says. I'm going to show you that verse here in a moment. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. <laughs> they said, whenever they're resurrected, who's she married to? They don't even believe in the resurrection. So they're coming asking a question that's a what if question about something they don't even believe. So they're wasting their time and his time because they don't want an answer. They're just trying to make him look bad. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Now, I'm going to go on with that here in a minute, but he says they do err. Now, that's hilarious to me, and it should be hilarious to you if you know your Bible. Let's go back to the place that he's asking about, Deuteronomy chapter 25. This is what the law says. But before the law, there was something like this that happened too. But go back to the law, Deuteronomy chapter 25. Verse 5 through 10. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5 through 10. If brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and shall take her to him to wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. And that's what he's talking about. So would we do that today? Say I have a brother. Only and Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh Adventists do this if they're following the law. I don't know if they do. But let's say my brother died. I have to go and marry. What if I'm already married? Well, back then they would have had two wives. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that weird? But if I was already married, uh, that, I, just, I can't see going and taking your brother's wife. But then when you do that, now you can't claim that child as yours. You have to, for the rest of your life, say, no, that's my brother's son. So that he always has a name, the, the, the brother, that's remembered by him. Isn't that odd? Does that just seem foreign to us? But look at this. This is pretty funny. Verse 7, And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. 
Then the elders of his, of his city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her. Maybe she's ugly or something. I don't know. <laughs> then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say, so shall it be done unto that man that will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him that hath his shoe loosed. Old one shoe. Now, was there a time in the Bible when this took place? Have you ever read the book of Ruth? The Bible says there's a kinsman redeemer, the one that's closer. So Ruth went to Boaz, but there was another guy that had the right. And that guy says, no, I don't want her. And then Boaz got to marry her. Do you know what that means? That means there was a time when she went in there and she spit in his face. And that guy says, no, I don't want to marry you. She says, fine. And then she went, and then got down, took his shoe and walked away. <laughs> Isn't that wild? And that guy had to walk the rest of his life with one shoe. So everyone in Israel knows this guy disobeyed the law. Isn't that wild? You know what that's a type of? Boaz is the type of Christ. So that's a type of the law. The law cannot redeem us. The law cannot save us. So we can look at the law and literally go, I don't have to do what you say. I'm going to heaven because I married him. Now, we look at the law as what he wants because we know he wrote the law. But I'm just saying it's not the law that saves us. We're redeemed by Christ. Isn't that amazing? All right, so let's go back. So you do greatly, therefore, err, it says in the New Testament, not knowing the scriptures. There was a, it's two R's though. You do therefore greatly err. Did you know there's a guy in the Bible named Ur? What a dumb name, man. Let's go, I don't know if I should go here, but let's do it. Let's go to Genesis chapter 38 because this is pre-law, right? Before the law. And sometimes we see before the law, God telling people to do things that later he wrote into the law. And so in Genesis chapter 38, Here's a guy that God told, hey, your brother died. I want him to have sons. So I want you to go do this. Watch what happens. <laughs> Genesis 38, verse 8. And Judah said unto Onan, go in unto thy brother's wife and marry her and raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground, lest that he should give seed unto his brother. And the whole thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. So this guy Ur, okay, verse 3, and conceived and bare a son and called his name Ur. So there was Ur and Onan. <laughs> Isn't that funny though? Jesus is talking about what they're bringing up. And he then brings up a literal guy named Ur. And he says, you do therefore greatly Ur. It's kind of like Jesus going, you guys ought to die for your sin. I was like, which one are you? <laughs> and why would they bring a sexual thing to Jesus unless that's all they were thinking about? You know, you got to wonder if that's what, what that was on their minds. But it's just kind of funny, Ur and Onan. And that was the guy before the law. It's all, if you know your Bible, you can just kind of see these things and go, this is interesting. But uh, still, I don't know if I'd want to do that if I had a brother. And <laughs> that just, that seems weird. What if your brother likes ugly women. <laughs> you have to go and get it up. I guess I'll walk around without my shoe on for the rest of my life. But thank God we're not under the Old Testament law, right? But it all... And thank God I don't have a brother. Okay. And let's go to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. So it's just, that's very interesting, isn't it? So Jesus says here in verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, you do err. Well, we spell it with two R's. But when we say err, we just say E-R. And that was the name of the guy in the Old Testament. So I took you back to him. He says, You do err not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry, nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Now so much I could get into there. So are we Barbie dolls and Ken dolls when we get our glorified bodies? <laughs> it sounds like we don't get married in heaven. So that's comforting to some people and not comforting to others. Because if you live 60, 70, 80 years and you're married and you go to heaven, you're thinking, I'll be married in heaven with my wife because we were married all those years. Well, what about the lady that married a guy and he died? She married another guy and he died. She married another guy and he died. And she gets to heaven. She's like, oh, which one's my husband? Well, it doesn't work that way. God says there is no marriage in heaven. 
in Luke also. I think, I think it's chapter 20. We might look at that here in a little bit. So when we get to heaven, we're going to be like the angels. But do you remember how the angels fell? Does that mean we can fall? Well, I don't see how because it says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. So we have free will now. I don't think we'll have free will then. Angels had free will to do that. Well, now they can't be saved. So something changes when we get a glorified body. We won't have any desire for that. And we won't need to do that is what it appears. So a lot more I could get into, but we'll, we'll drop that. We won't go back to... Yeah, we won't, we won't go back to Genesis 6 either and talk about how those angels did what they did. But it is interesting because it's why we say down here, till death do us part when we talk about marriage, because it's over. You don't get to heaven and go, well, I really like that girl. I wish I could have married. God, can I marry her now? It doesn't work. It's down here where the do the marry thing. And that's the short version. We'll leave it there. All right. So verse 30, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, so Jesus doesn't let it go. He answers her question and he goes, now, by the way, you don't believe in a resurrection, do you? So why would you ask me this question? But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, so many things why Jesus would say this. My first thought, God is not the God of the dead because the Egyptians believed in a God of the dead. What was his name? I can't. It was that ugly one with the, was it the, was the hippopotamus face one? Was that the God of the dead? It was one of those that they believe was the Osiris, I think it was, but I forget what he looked like. He says, God is not, were, were they worshiping that God? Because they had worshipped false gods. Maybe that was a, hey, whose God is your God? But it says, but of the living. So when God says God is not the God of the dead, but of the living, what is he saying? He's saying Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive somewhere. So maybe they're not alive in this world, but they're still alive in the other world, the afterlife. So what does that mean? Everything they believed and stood for is an outright lie. And they're coming and asking him a question about something they don't even believe in. And Jesus goes, hey, um, maybe what you believe is wrong. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. The multitude were astonished. What about those guys? They probably stormed off in a huff and were all upset about it because he just destroyed them completely <laughs> right there. So Jesus is saying that Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are still alive somewhere in the spirit world. Remember, they didn't believe in the resurrection, so they didn't believe in what? Hell or Abraham's bosom. So there's another way to look at that. Um, Jesus is saying, hey, where are you going to end up? If there is no hell and no judgment, then you can sin and never give account to God. And there's no repercussions. So you don't worry about what you do. And that's the danger of going around teaching there's no heaven and no hell. There is a hell. Okay, so now, verse 33. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. <laughs> so it's just like one after another. Boom, here come the Pharisees. Boom, oh, they walk away. Here come the Herodians. Boom, they walk away. Here come the Sadducees. They're about to walk away. They think they can defeat Jesus Christ, and they can't. Then one of them asked... Uh, then one of them, which was a lawyer, uh-oh, here we go. Here's what happens today. It's called lawfare. Have you ever heard of lawfare? <laughs> um, the three most crookedest people in the world are what? Car salesmen, lawyers, and politicians. Watch out for those three because you know they're lying when their lips are moving. That's what they say. And maybe doctors too? No, no, I don't say that. I'm joking there. <laughs> but um, so you, you look at this. How do they do their warfare today. A lot of time it's through lawfare. And the court system is so expensive, you're ruined if they come after you. That's just the way they work. Only the rich people get the better lawyers. It's kind of sad. When it started in America, the founding fathers, a lot of them were lawyers. They would go out of their way to help the poor people because they wanted to be an example of helping people because they knew the poor people couldn't afford the better lawyers. They would always devote part of their time. Same with doctors. A lot of times doctors would devote their time to try to help people. Nowadays we're seeing it's all about money, unfortunately. So there in verse um, 
35, then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So when you look at that, you think about it. Yeah, if you love God with all your heart and you care about your neighbor, that'd be a great society to live in, wouldn't it? Because everybody would care about other people and try not to do wrong. No stealing, no lying, no... No doing evil. Well, that'd be a great way to live, wouldn't it? So that's a pretty simple answer. And in the Old Testament, we find where Jesus is quoting this from. So let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and see where Jesus is quoting from. Because Jesus just doesn't say it. He always goes back to the law. And dealing with the lawyer, that lawyer ought to know where that is in the law. So if the law says that, what can a lawyer do? He just hangs his head and walks away. <laughs> He's like, wow, he knows the law too. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. And we read, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thine soul, and with all thine might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. All right, that is the first commandment. The second one's in Leviticus 19, 18. Leviticus 19, 18. So Jesus knew his Bible. Genesis, I mean, uh, Leviticus 19, 18. Jesus knew his Bible probably better than that lawyer knew his Old Testament. Leviticus 19, 18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Why didn't Jesus quote that part? I am the Lord. He'd already told him, I am. I and my father are one. But do you think that lawyer, if he knew that law, he would have said in his mind, you didn't quote the last part. I am. The, oh, maybe that is the Messiah. That is the Lord. Bye. <laughs> so maybe that's how Jesus is doing that. Because I see that many times as we go back and look. There's always a little bit left off. And it's supposed to be like, now fill in the blanks. And so I think that might be part of it. All right. So back to Matthew chapter 22. See if we can finish this up. We're getting close. I hope I didn't miss anything. Um, now it says verse 41, and, and there's a lot more I could say about that, but instead of giving them the Ten Commandments, Jesus says the first and, and second of all the commandments are these two, and all the rest of the law is on those two. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, so he goes, you keep asking me these questions. I had three different groups asking me three different questions. Let me ask you something. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, what think ye of, of Christ? of the Messiah. Christ means the anointed one. Messiah means anointed one. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. So they give the right answer because they knew their Old Testament. And the Old Testament says that God promised David a seed from David that would be the Messiah. So they're looking at whoever can put his ancestry back to David that comes on a certain time according to the prophecy of Daniel, that will be the Messiah. Well, The beginning of the book of Matthew tells us Jesus comes from David. So they say unto him, the son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Now, I love the word durst. We don't say durst enough. Laura and I were talking about that this morning. Durst thou understandeth? I mean, I love that word durst. It's kind of cool. But what is he talking about here? Laura said she still didn't quite get this. So let's go look at Psalms chapter uh, 110 and verse 1. This is David. And David, it says in the Spirit. So he's got the Holy Spirit in him as he writes this. So the Old Testament is the Holy Spirit writing, uh, or it's Holy Spirit's words, and men write down what the Spirit of God says for them to say. So this is God speaking. So this is the Father in heaven speaking to the Son, Jesus Christ. And in Psalms chapter 110, in verse 1, The Lord, okay, that's the Father, said unto my Lord, How is there two Lords? Is there only one Lord? Yeah, these three are one, okay? But how does the Lord say to the Lord? That makes it sound like there's two Lords. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies a footstool. 
So how is that not two gods? Because the Jews believe in one God. So Jesus goes, doesn't that sound like two gods? How could the Lord say to the Lord, sit you on my right hand? And they're just sitting there going, I don't know. Well, we know, don't we? We know exactly what this is. We know that the doctrine of the Godhead, or what we call the Trinity, is one God in three, and these three are one. So it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit of God in David said, write this down. Because someday the Father is going to look over at the Son and say, sit here on my right hand. And both of them are the Lord. That's one Lord, because I and my Father are one. That's not two different gods. Okay, so he's asking that. Now, what is that inferring to them? That the Messiah is the Lord. So that he is God manifest in the flesh. But they're looking at that and they're like, I don't I don't understand how to answer that because they only see one God and they don't see how Jesus could be God in the flesh. They only think of one God in heaven. They don't see how God in heaven could come down as a man. So they're. Ignorant and blind, if you will, that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Now, you could read the rest of Psalms 110 when you get a chance, because what's interesting is the context is when Jesus comes back as the Lord to reign for a thousand years. So the context is Armageddon of Psalms chapter 110. Let's finish this up with the cross reference in Luke chapter 20 and see if we get any more information. Because when we do, it's a little interesting. Basically, what we find out is all those three groups that came to Jesus, they're all going to hell. Because of what? Because of unbelief. They came to Jesus not in belief accepting Him. They came in unbelief attacking Him and questioning Him, trying to make Him look bad because they didn't accept Him. They'd already made up their mind, I don't accept Him. And as we read the cross reference in Luke chapter 20, look at the end of this passage because it tells us straight out, these guys aren't even saved. So in Luke chapter 20, verse 27 through 44. Then came to him certain of the Sadducees, which deny that there is any resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If any man's brother die, having a wife, and he die without children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. There were therefore seven brethren, and the first took a wife and died without children, and the second took her to wife, and he died childless, and the third took her, and in like manner the seven also, and they left no children and died. Last of all, the woman died also. See how this is so stupid. It's just really, a, why would seven guys die? What if, I don't know, I was going to say, what if the woman killed them, but I don't know. Uh, but anyway, uh, but it just, they're making up foolishness, and they're just proving what they are. They're fools. And I think that's what we're starting to see today. The people that are in power are very foolish and are showing who they are. And the more they do what they do, the more foolish they look. But anyway, it says, Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife of them is she? For seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels. So that's more information. You can't die anymore. So when we get a glorified body, we'll never die again. That's wonderful. And it says, And are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush, when he calleth the Lord the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Well, then he adds that part. I don't remember reading Moses at the bush in the other part. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. Then certain of the scribes answering said, Master, thou hast well said. And after that, they durst not ask him any questions at all. And he said unto them, How say they that Christ is David's son? And David himself saith in the book of Psalms, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore calleth him Lord. How is he then his son? Hmm. So how can... He be God and the Son of some man on earth at the same time. Because God chose to come through the lineage of that man. We see it, but they couldn't see it. Then in the audience of all the people, he said unto his disciples, Beware of the scribes. Okay, this is the part we don't get in the other passage. So Jesus says this to all the people. Now, did they hear it or did they walk away? Then in the audience of all the people, he said unto his disciples, Beware of the scribes which desire to walk in long robes, and love greetings in the markets and in the highest seats and in the synagogues and the chief rooms at feasts, 
which devour widows' houses and for a show make long prayers, the same shall receive greater damnation. These people are a bunch of liars, deceivers, and thieves. And yet they're the richest people and they're the ones in power. Kind of like today, perhaps, <laughs> when you look at senators and congressmen and presidents and, you know, and their sons, and Verisma, and, uh, and, they, and how they get kickbacks and, and just, wow, interesting. So that is Matthew 22. Not a lot there, but enough to show us once again that Jesus Christ is God. To show us again, to warn us, watch out for this group, this group that wanted riches over redemption. They wanted defilement over deliverance. They wanted politics over purity. And all they cared about was the things of this life. They weren't thinking about, hey, lay up treasures in heaven by doing right here. And then things will be better in the next life. So any questions or comments so we can finish this up? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Let me talk about the Sadducees that don't believe in resurrection. You know, have a lot of people new age, and, you know, they're talking about, you know, the three beliefs. And so, to me, I always in my mind said, to think that you're never ever going to exist, I'm not thinking about, oh, I can't do anything, and that's okay. I'm just thinking, like, I was like, Daddy, you're never going to exist again. That is the only, that's the scary to me. So, I'm very thankful that we have the hope of God, you know, right. for Jesus. When you were in the Jehovah Witnesses, they taught that. They taught when you die, you just don't exist anymore. You think you're going to leave? Right. So your a Jehovah Witness believes you got to stay alive to make it into here. Yeah, you go but what if you die before you make it into here? They yeah. teach annihilation. Uh, what is the word? Yeah. Annihilation of the soul. They teach your soul no longer exists, so you no longer exist. That's one of their main teachings. But they also teach there's no hell either. So they teach when you die you don't go to hell because they don't believe in hell. Yeah. So the guy that started it said there's no hell. And so Jehovah Witnesses don't believe there's a place called hell. Yeah, so, again, it's, to me, they sound like these people is what they sound like. Okay, anybody else? Ray? I was just going to say the Herodians kind of sound like the rhinos in the <laughs> R-I-N-O. It's right there. R-I-N-O. Huh. Isn't that interesting? So it's in the letters are in there. So they're the modern day rhinos, if you will. Okay. Yes, ma'am. As far as when the wedding and the dinner in the grounds go, I have a theory that it cannot be during, the wedding can't be in heaven during the tribulation. Here's why. <laughs> this is my theory. Because it, let's say we, we get through the judgment seat of Christ and have a wedding right at the end there. We're not going to have a wedding and then go straight to war and then have dinner on the grounds. In the Old Testament, there was that I don't know if it's called a tradition, it was more of a law, that when a Jewish man gets married, he doesn't go to war for a whole year. He gets to stay at home with his wife for a whole year. So, I don't think the wedding can be in, during the tribulation at all in heaven. And even if it was at the beginning of the tribulation, we're not going to have a wedding and then the judgment seat of Christ and then go to war and then have dinner on the ground. So that doesn't make sense. So my theory is the wedding has to be after Armageddon. Okay. And that's possible. I mean, we come up here, we're judged for the rewards we get, we come back and fight, then's the wedding. And that could be down here, and then these are the guests to Is come in. Is it really going to be a battle, though? Yeah. Um, Is it really going to be a battle? The Battle of Armageddon. Yeah. Well, he comes back. Yeah. It's, it's, it'll be over pretty quickly, but we'll be behind him. So Armageddon, down there's the Valley of Megiddo. That's where they're all defeated. But from there, Jesus continues, and we go behind him. So do we get to go to other places and continue the battle or something? I don't know. That's something I always wondered about. Because all over the world, there'll be people with the mark of the beast. Somebody's got to pitch them into hell. Right. right but second. who's pitching into hell all the people with the mark of the beast that are in London, that are in Africa, that are in, you He's know, all powerful. He, can he could do it. But maybe that's what he has us do. I don't. Another question. Isn't it during the millennium when people will get pitched into hell like that? Yeah. And also um, there's a verse that says the angels will, will throw people into hell. We're like the angels. So are we throwing people into hell? That's another question. So when we're there in the millennial kingdom, are we perhaps 
like the police or something? Are we, I don't know. There's a lot of questions I have, but that's an interesting point. It could be that the wedding's out here and that would make more sense what we just read. The guests are the ones that come in. Yes. Well, I understand it. A traditional Jewish wedding party is seven days long. So a Jewish wedding party is seven days long. So that's interesting. So you got seven years here instead of seven days, seven years. Sometimes a day is like years, years are like a day. Sometimes a day is a thousand years, a thousand years. So that's interesting. A lot of good stuff here. I know I skipped over some stuff, but I don't, I don't have time to go there. That, that the wedding could be right after the rapture and it takes that seven years for the wedding. And then, yeah, I believe that too. Yeah, so, so, yeah, something like that. And I forgot to give the, I meant to do it last week, the three offices of Jesus. Well, first he comes as a prophet in his ministry. Then he dies for our sins. He's the priest now. Then he comes back over here. He's a king. So there's prophet, priest, and king. And Jesus fulfills all three in, in that order. Yeah, yes. I believe like the way he was saying, because why the tribulation is going over here? We are the bride. We are going to the wedding feast. Because by the time we come back for the Armageddon, we already like, you know, once you get married, then you get your wife and we'll do together what you need to do. So mm -hmm. for that part is already done. So see, we don't know, but there's two ways to look at it. Yeah, so do we get married here and come back with them? Or is the marriage, maybe we get married here, but then the supper is down here. See, that's, so it could be any, we'll find out, won't we? Go ahead. <laughs> so would, would the Old Testament prophets like Abraham, you know, Jacob, all those guys, Isaiah, all the way up to the uh, cross, would they be the guests of that uh, what? Well, that's a long study right there of who are the guests, but the guests will be those that aren't the bride. Right. So it'd have to be these guys back here. Right. Now there's guests, there's the bride, there's guests, then there's, what do they call it? Bride, uh, not bridegroom, what is that? Friends of the bridegroom. Now, who are the friends of the bridegroom? Is, are the friends of the bridegroom maybe um, John the Baptist and, and other people? Who are these friends of the bridegroom? So there's these, all these things. So I don't know. <laughs> maybe they just all are guests if they aren't the bride. But uh, Rockman used to teach friends of the bridegroom applies to others. And so there's other groups. Because what if some Gentiles get through here without taking the mark of the beast and they go through that? Who will they be? So are they guests? Are they friends of the bridegroom? Are they, I don't know. It's just, it's hard to get that all down. So that's one of those things we'll, we'll know more by and by, amen? Yeah. But yeah, that makes sense. They, but it sounds like the guests are people that go through here or here. And then there are guests during that time. Is the wedding up here and then the supper down here? Or is the wedding and supper over here? This is how church is split because people want to argue. So we're not arguing about it. We're just asking. I don't know. So, <laughs> so how long does the judgment seat of Christ take? Well, here's the thing. When we go out, we're in eternity because we're not in the earth anymore. So it could take in eternity if you want to put time on it. So there's no time in eternity, but it could take millions of years <laughs> and then pop back in seven years later because when you're in eternity, there's no time. So who knows? We could be up there for uh, it's only seven years here on earth, but in that time, it could be however long God needs it to be. Well, and smoke up the place a little bit. When we go. I know, man. As long as you're not vaping. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, you know the judgment seat of Christ. It's going to be simple. It's going to be, it's going to be amazing because at the great white throne of judgment, they see all their sins that they did, and they feel bad about it. Well, our sins are on the blood, so we don't see our sins. Thank God. But God throws it on there, and then whatever was a sin, that comes out as smoke. So that will be the shame is the smoke. But at least we don't get to see everything we did. Thank God that's under the blood, and we'll never see that again. But yeah, can you imagine smoke in heaven? So we'll all be coughing when Ray goes before. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but amen. All right. You got to stop it, man. So. Anybody else? Anybody else? I, I enjoyed this. I hope you did too. But anybody else? So I didn't say don't pay your taxes. Get it over with. But also try to find a really good tax agent that shows you all the loopholes. Because all these people know where every loophole is, don't they? It's been shown that many of these higher up politicians pay less taxes than we do. And they make a whole lot more. Because they wrote the laws. They know the loopholes that we don't. So you get a good tax agent or lawyer, you can... 
you can do that. <laughs> Not have to pay so much. Anybody else? All right. Thank you for being here with us.